Hello to all you wonderful book lovers all over Australia. This is Fiona McIntosh beaming out to you from a corner of my sitting room. We've got lights, we've got camera, we've got action. And welcome to chapter one, which is being hosted by Dimux, um, a fantastic initiative that's going to allow you to have this sort of um, interaction with writers like myself. But there's a whole range of fantastic um, innovations plan to keep you connected with the books that you love, the writers that you love and each other, not to mention your favorite bookstore. All right, now I've been asked, well, good evening as well. I've been asked to talk about The Diamond Hunter. Now, don't all groan. I know you all know this book. Um, and for those who've heard my podcast, there is going to be a little bit of overlap, but I'm, I'll try and do something um, that has more information in it. We're doing this because a lot of you um, tried so hard to see me last year when I was on tour for this book. And um, due to the bushfires and a lot of cancellations, so many very loyal readers couldn't get to see me. So I've been feeling um, quite badly about that. And I'm trying to make it up to you by making sure that I try and do some of what I would have done at those events with you now. So if you're happy for me to, um, start where I usually start, um, because it's usually the burning question from everyone, um, where does the idea come from? Now, for all of you, you who've heard my podcast or were at my events, go and put the kettle on and make yourself a cup of tea and be back in a few minutes, because um, I'm going to take some time with those who don't know this story. Um, it really arose out of The Pearl Thief. Now, The Pearl Thief, um, back in 2018, was my highest selling book. Um, so thank you to all of you for helping me to achieve that. The thing about The Pearl Thief is when, before it was released, I already knew it was my best book. In, in terms of, as a writer, uh, it, was, it was the best of me and that's how it should be, but it was also my favorite story. Everything about it is what I love, a revenge story for a start. Who doesn't love a revenge story? Uh, it was a woman, a broken woman, um, who was being forced to confront her worst demons and having to find the courage to turn around, face them, and then say, I'm, I'm actually coming for you. You know, I'm not going to run away anymore. I'm coming for you. So you'd better be looking out. I loved all the characters, um, the, the, the men that orbit around this woman, the, the setting of the swinging 60s um, in London and the throwback into wartime Prague. And then there was Paris. Um, it, everything about this book sang to everything that I love about storytelling. And so um, there was this sort of moment where people were saying to me from the publishing team, so what's next? And I felt frozen because it wasn't a case of writer's block. It was simply, I didn't know how to follow that story. And it was just a stroke of luck that I happened to be in Yorkshire um, gathering up a final scene that my editor wanted uh, in The Pearl Thief. And she'd said that there's so much tension, so much drama, so much emotion in this story, and you're not giving us a chance to breathe. So Fiona, can you please put in a lovely scene, outdoor scene that allows us all to just exhale and let go of all this tension that's in our bodies. And so I was over in Yorkshire trying to find the location and the part of the story that I could sort of bolt into here. And with a stroke of luck, as I said, a cousin that I hadn't seen for two decades um, hunted me down and said, don't move, I'm coming up to see you. He found me in Yorkshire. And of course, we were catching up over copious um, pots of tea. And ultimately, the story came around so what is coming next? And I told him my dilemma. And he said, oh, that's easy. I can solve that for you. Don't Let's just do diamonds. And of course, it was only then um, the penny clicked for me that my cousin Andrew had been working in diamonds all of his working life. His entire career had been with the De Beers group. And he said, write about diamonds. I can open all the right doors for you. And it began to feel real like we could do this and he said i'll go one better fiona if you make if you shake hands over a cup of tea now i'll meet you in africa and i will take you out 
to the Kimberley mine and I will open all the right doors there with De Beers for you. And so he was as good as his word and we met in Africa and so began this great story. One of the amusing parts of it though is he expected me to arrive with a complete story and, and that I could tell him what it was all going to be about and he could say, oh, we need to go here and we need to go there. And we met in Cape Town um, airport um, you know, running towards each other and laughing that we'd actually done this and hugging each other. And he said, all right, let's go and have lunch and you tell me what the story is. And I had to say that there's no story, Andrew. Um, and he was horrified, just horrified. I mean, he did, truly looked gobsmacked. And I said, oh, no, that's not how I work. I have to wait for the story to find me. And he said, what is this gobbledygook that you're talking? This sounds like arty farty stuff. And I said, no, 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 just walk me around, take me to places that you know and the story will come and tap me on the shoulder. And he said, I can't believe we're doing this. And I said, just trust me. And he did. And of course, the story began to form in my mind. Um, it was actually after I left Cape Town that the story began to happen. The first thing that happened was um, I had a guide. I had a marvelous guide that we paid to um, teach us about the 1870s and this amazing diamond rush that happened around the world. It was a global thing. People came from every corner of the earth, including Australia and New Zealand, to come and mine um, in, this in this small area in South Africa where um, the Eureka diamond had been found. I think that's what triggered it all. Certainly um, a big diamond had been found and people just flopped. Um, these were the days of, of gold rushes and diamond rushes and people trying to make a quick um, fortune for themselves and so that that appealed to me I thought okay there's a story there there's going to be a story and I had this um, I had my character this fellow James Knight who was a, a poor man a poor engineer but a, a very charismatic guy who manages to woo um, without trying very hard a very wealthy heiress not deliberately I mean they are genuinely in love this couple but her family are most disapproving about James and so I was thinking oh here we are here's all the drama here's all the conflict I've got this couple and he's planning to sail away to Australia with her and um, seek their fortune over in Australia and the family thought let them go at least there's a society in Australia and you know she can live a good life but of course he gets waylaid in Africa when he hears about this diamond rush and he offloads his wife and their young child and um, it's at this point that the story began to form in my mind because the only way to get from the docks of Fremantle, uh, sorry, from the docks of Cape Town to um, the diamond mines in the Kim, what was we call Kimberley now, but it was just in the middle of nowhere, um, was by Oxwagon. And so my guide not only showed me what one of these ox wagons looked like, but he said, I'll, I'm going to drive you out into the little Karoo Desert so you can see what life was like. And it was, you know, it, the silence was so um, petrifying. I could hear my heartbeat. There were no creatures. There were no insects. There was no bird song. It was just silent. And there were mountains, these massive mountains that these oxen had to get across or get through and over. And it would take, if they were lucky, if they had a good run with no problems, 42 days. Um, and when they got there, there was no accommodation. Um, and these are women with children and, you know, older women, um, um, older men and they were they were just living under canvas they were living in tents and all of this added to the tension and richness of the story and as i say i thought i was writing about um, this couple but as i began to look at their daughter and work out how she was going to um, play into the story it all began to make sense to me this is not the story about this couple this is the story about their daughter clementine and her growing up as a very wealthy youngster in her own right, but with no knowledge of it, and just running wild like an urchin around the desert of Africa, helping her father to find diamonds, to mine for diamonds. And he starts out um, dredging for diamonds in alluvial deposits and ultimately with a spade and um, a bucket digging for diamonds. And it's, I mean, the actual stories of 
real life were extraordinary and totally inspired me um, for my storytelling. And so that, that's where it happened. And Andrew couldn't believe that within, a, within 24 hours of me arriving at the mine site, which is called the big hole, actually. And I don't know, it, we might be able to show you um, what that looks like today. It might come up on the screen for you. Um, but if it doesn't, we'll show it to you later. And the big hole was dug by men with shovels and buckets and muscle. There were no animals. There was no engineering going on. It was all muscle power. And the, this hole that they dug, um, you might see it coming up on your screen now. It may not look that big on um, in the photograph, but I can assure you, when I was standing there taking that photograph, my jaw was open. It is the biggest, biggest hole, um, and there was no water in it as there is now. And they just kept digging for diamonds, um, and they found plenty. They found loads. Uh, you can see this from space. It's so big. And this is where the town of Kimberley grew up in South Africa. And that's where the main action of my story takes place. And um, once I stood there, it all came rushing in. It, 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 you know, the character tapped me on the shoulder. The story tapped me on the shoulder. I knew what I was writing. I thought I was setting out to write about um, diamonds, you know, a big diamond find. But it wasn't. I was actually writing about this little girl growing up into this woman um, and I was trying not to write a love story because the Pearl Thief was such a wonderful love story and I thought I'm, go I'm going to pull right away from a love story um, and I put all sorts of um, burdens on myself not only was it not to be a love story it was not going to be in any of my usual stomping grounds so that's why I chose Africa and also it wasn't to be in my usual era I like the two world wars, but I made myself go back to 1870 and this the first diamond rush. And that in itself was the most enormous challenge. It was terrifying um, because I knew nothing about the Victorian era. I knew what I knew from television and reading books, but to study it, research it, as I knew I would need to in order to put this book together, um, it really, um, you know, it daunted me to have to build this world for the reader to make it feel credible and real. But uh, there's nothing like a challenge to make the best come out of you. And so as a writer, I was, um, I had this mountain to climb and there was some fun and excitement in that as well, in testing myself. And so that's what I did. The research began in Africa. And after I'd done all the research that I could, um, and you'll know all the scenes that from the story, but then I had to think about, well, where else are they going to be? This little girl's not going to grow up in Africa. She's going to grow up in um, London, actually, um, and, and even further north in Northumberland. So I don't know if we, you, you might see another slide come up, and there's a house in um, in real life called Cragside. And so I found this place in Northumberland and thought, there it is. There's my house for Clementine. That's where she's going to grow up as this fabulously wealthy um, little girl who's got this distant memory of being in Africa. And um, because she was, she's, I'm not spoiling anything. She's ripped away from her tent, her little hovel where she's living with her father and a Zulu warrior. And I'll let you discover that through the story. Um, and she's coming to live, perhaps it's up on your screen now, this glorious pile, which in real life is called Cragside and is extraordinary. If any of you get to Britain and um, do go, if you're there in the summer months, that's when Cragside is open. Just the gardens alone will blow you away. And I don't know if I can ask maybe for the slide of the um, bridge to come up. In the story of the Diamond Hunter, there's a bridge at Cragside. Now, here it's a little wooden bridge, but I decided to make it a wrought iron bridge that the um, engineer, James Knight, um, designs and builds for the woman that he loves. And so um, th this bridge that I'm standing on here, if you can see me, I'm very tiny. I'm that little red dot there um, standing on a little timber bridge. And, and that's from the story as well. Look how beautiful it is. Please go if you're going to England. So, so I had to go up to Northumberland and find this house and find where she grew up. Other places, I mean, 
you have to find lots of locations when you're writing historical fiction and you've you've not only got to find them but you've got to think firstly were they around in my era that I'm writing about but now how can I make them come back to life in that era so the places I went hunting for was somewhere um, for people to have um, a rather swanky lunch and I found the old criterion at Piccadilly and it's still there um, it was first built in the 1860s or something like that um, and you might see a slide pop up and we were able I was able to get in there and have a look at it today it hasn't changed a lot it's perhaps become a bit more blingy but essentially what you see here is how it would have looked um, when my two um, characters are meeting there. Uh, some other places, um, I went and found the old original Twinings tea shop, which is in the city of London. Again, it's just across the road from the Royal um, Courts of Justice. So if you're ever around that area, um, go and have a look. It's a wonderful place to go in and, and, and buy your tea and talk to them about the history of tea. I needed a place where my heroine, my heroine could um, fall in, fall in love, um, make this wonderful friendship um, with a man, um, and I decided I needed to find, for for whatever reason, a butterfly house. Can you believe I found one? Um, it's at the Horniman Museum, and it's in it's in London. But what you see, what you might see on your screen is this beautiful. Um, glass house. Now that is at the Horniman Museum, but I decided to borrow that tropical plant house and turn it into my tropical butterfly house and in the story. So this is the sort of thing, a, you know, a historical writer has to do. You have to go hunting for these places and um, that were around in the, the era of your story and then see how can you use it? How can you adapt it? Other places I went to, I went to Chalk Hill Farm and then I walked to the top of Primrose Hill, having decided that I could very easily live in Primrose Hill. Um, and then I had to imagine what the skyline looked like. And I worked out that only St. Paul's um, was the only rooftop you could have seen from that vantage point. Right now, you can see the whole of the city of London. You know, you could see St. Paul's and you could see the Houses of Parliament, I should, I should say as well. So, um, all of these places have to be found. So I spend a long time trudging across the landscape, thinking, what would I like to do with my characters and what sort of location do I need? And so I have to find about, usually about 10 locations um, in, in each place in order to build this world for you. Um, the Royal Exchange um, might bob up on your um, screen. That's where one of my characters, um, he's a Lloyds of London, um, insurance broker. He's a main character and that's where Lloyd's of London um, began operations. They started in a coffee house, can you believe, and it grew into um, this amazing, uh, the Royal Exchange itself, which you can see there. Um, it looked a lot different in the day, but the actual architecture hasn't changed at all. Now it's like a glorious shopping centre for, um, you know, very, very upmarket um, um, stores but it's beautiful to go and visit as the Royal Exchange and it's by the Bank of England so it's very very interesting. Um, the final place in England that I needed to see and I don't have a slide for you is Hatton Garden um, which is where all the diamonds um, of the world really found their way to be um, sold and turned into jewellery or sold as stones. And you know that Hatton Garden is um, traditionally a Jewish quarter of London. And the Jews were very, very good as diamond sorters, as diamond cutters, um, and the whole industry of diamonds, the Jews had a very strong role to play there. And now that I mention it, I realized that I um, used to date a diamond sorter. Um, and I don't know why I didn't sort of think of this before. Uh, and so I had a lot of um, I had quite a few friends who were diamond sorters and they were working for big companies. And, but, you know, I, I didn't know how to get in contact with them again because I've been so long in Australia now uh, to try and hunt them down again would have been quite tricky. But I wouldn't have minded going behind the scenes to watch them sorting. I know that it's um, um, and I had visions of sort of pressing them under my nails and walking out. No one would know. I had all these ideas whilst I was um, 
uh, d d writing this book of how you could steal diamonds. Um, the, the, there are plenty of ways, and I'm sure um, people are work security are well ahead of me. So, in terms of the book itself, Clementine, she's um, she's a beautiful little character who grows up through the story and become, turns into this quite um, self-possessed individual. She's got very strong opinions. Um, and maybe that's born out of money. She's never had to suffer, but she's very aware of people who have less than her. And she's one of these people um, who did try and um, look after others who had uh, a lot less, particularly the poverty stricken. And she has this um, memory of a marvelous character in the story called Joseph Wanshu. Um, I'm sure anyone who's read the book will be nodding and thinking, yeah, he was a beautiful character, very sympathetic character. He's a Zulu warrior who was sent by his chief, and this is all legit. This sort of thing did happen back in the 1870s. Um, the Zulu chieftain would have sent one of his prime warriors to go to these diamond fields and, and mine and find these diamonds and sell it to the white man and um, get the money because we quite like to be able to buy the guns that the white man is using against us at the moment. So um, there were loads of Africans who were um, digging quite happily and all getting on very well um, in these diamond, th these diamond mines. I have to say the whole world was there and everybody was getting on quite well. They'd staked out their claims and they were not necessarily looking after one another, but they were certainly, um, it was a real melting pot and there were, there were scuffles broke out and I'm sure there was crime. But, you know, I think they managed to get it quite right during these times, despite all the poverty. And most people were poor. It was only 10% of the population of the miners that was actually striking it rich, probably less, actually. Um, the rest were living hand to mouth, you know. And so this Joseph character, and you have to read the book to understand why he's called Joseph Wanshu. Um, he and Clement, Clementine form this incredible friendship. This bond is unbreakable. And um, that's the love story in the story. So it's a, a love story about friendship rather than romantic love. And she is pulled away from Joseph. And again, this is not spoiling anything when she's about, um, you know, she's very, very young. She's still an infant and she's pulled away. So she has memories of him but she can't quite work out why um, she was pulled away. And she remembers that time in Africa as glorious and, um, you know, carefree and wonderful and full of love and full of care. And so um, he is this brilliant character who sort of plays a cameo role. He's not in the story. Um, he doesn't get a lot of weight in the story, but when he's in those pages, He's super powerful. You're well aware of him um, being there. But there are some other characters. There's a character in there. I'm sure the people who've read the book will be saying, am I supposed to like this character or not? Because I don't trust him. And I know. I remember when my editor first read the book, she was saying the same thing. She said, I don't know whether to trust, trust this guy or not. Um, I'm not sure what he's up to. And I said, well, that's great because that's exactly how I want it to be. I, I, want, I want it to be shades of grey with this guy. Because for me, I loved him um, because I could see that everything he was trying to do was for the good of his family. Um, and But the way he went about it was really ill-advised. Um, and so, again, I won't spoil anything. I'll let you read the book and make up your own mind. So I had some fun with some characters as well. I was able to um, play around with some new types of characters that I'd never written before. So everything about The Diamond Hunter for me was, it's got to be so different to um, The Pearl Thief. The Pearl Thief was everything I knew, you know, it was France and it was Britain and it was um, a, a love story and it was the war and it was, um, you know, a, Nazis were involved. It was everything I was familiar with. The Diamond Hunter is everything I wasn't familiar with, just the fashion alone. I have to tell you, Victorian fashion, my gosh, what were those women thinking? Why did they want their asses in a bustle? Why did they want to look that much bigger? Why would they wear corsets and do that to themselves and change the shape of their bodies in the way that they did? So 
I really struggled with the fashion. I mean, it was some of it was very beautiful. The textures and the fabrics were very beautiful, but I couldn't help thinking they all looked like they were wearing um, sofa furnishings or curtains. And and so I I brought that into the story as a little bit of um, humour because I didn't. I really did struggle to handle all those bustles and was quite relieved by the end of it to say, gosh, will I ever be able to write a Victorian story again? And in order to do it, to write this story, um, I've got all these books here. I don't know if you can see them. This is about, I don't know, this is about a third of the books that I had to read. So this one's about London manor houses. I had to know that because I was going to write about um, the houses that they were living in in London and I had to get that right. Um, this one is an amazing book. I don't know, I hope you can see that, that light's getting in the way. This is all about the diggers um, and the diamond diggers and an extraordinary little book. I got so much information. I got a whole new education from this alone. Um, this is the history of diamonds that I had to learn about, um, worth reading. Here it is, this one, gosh, I couldn't have done it without this, how to be a Victorian. Um, and this was everything from how to get dressed in the morning as a Victorian, to how to eat, to how to go to the toilet as a Victorian. Ugh. And if you all know, I've got a phobia about public um, toilets. There we go. This is about Hatton Garden. So, you know, there's just so much reading material. This is the most extraordinary, beautiful, beautiful big book about the myths and the legends of the famous diamonds. Now, they're not relevant to the story, but, do you know, just knowing it made me feel more confident to write it, being able to just learn about diamonds, understand diamonds, and here's the big one. Look, I have to tell you, this not only cost a fortune, but we had to have it sent over, and this one, it's, it's a monster. It's just called, appropriately, diamonds. Um, and everything you ever want to know about diamonds is in this book and so I felt very lucky to find this overseas and to be able to have it sent over and I've read it from cover to cover but it's a sort of book you can pick up at any time and read you know loads of interesting facts about diamonds just knowing that diamonds every diamond that's in the world um, was already existing millions and millions of years ago. I mean, it, it's hard to wrap your head around these figures unless you're a geologist, I suppose, or a scientist of some sort. And that, you know, diamonds are time's way um, of showing us coal in its most brilliant form. So diamonds um, are coal, you know, they're, they're sort of 100% carbon um, under the most enormous pressure. Anyway, I'm not going to give you um, a tutorial in diamonds. We could be here all night if I do that. Um, I'm just trying to think what else I can tell you. Um, unless there are some questions that you're ready to start asking me, I, I hope you're. I hope there are hundreds of thousands of you out there, and I'm not just talking to my mother or my sons on the other end. Um, so do send through any questions that you might have. I've got a little laptop here, and if I look away, I'm just looking at the laptop to see if any of your questions are coming through. Um, in in other, um, I have been asked to tell you what's coming up. Um, are you interested to hear that? Uh, some of you know that I'm writing about uh, World War One and that it is entirely set in France, and I hear lots of cheering. Uh, people do love stories set in France, and um, it's set in Epinay. Now, how many of you have been to Epinay? I'm sure there are dozens and dozens and dozens of you. So you know that this is a story about champagne. So it's a story of champagne during World War I. Um, and oh gosh, I was, I was so lucky um, because I did the same thing. I, I'd already decided that I was going to write about champagne. Actually, my editor ordered it up. She said, could you do me a favor and write about champagne sometime? Because it's my favorite drink and I'd love you to write about it. And so I thought, well, why not? She's done plenty for me over the years. So, okay, I'll write a champagne story. And um, my husband <laughs> got us over there to do the research. And he said, you have got a story in mind, haven't you? And I said, no, I haven't. As you know, I'm just waiting. I'm just going to. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, we're just going to walk the Avenue de Champagne and we're going to wait for a story to find me. And he said, you make me so nervous when you do this. Anyway, we did just that. We walked the avenue, it's quite, quite a long street, and um, 
walked along, walked along. We were looking at Moet and we were looking at all these different famous brands, you know, uh, that we know. And um, this is the, their sort of uh, flagship um, chateau that is uh, on display for everybody to see when they when they want the tourists want to come visiting. And they were all rather um, grand and sort of um, over the top. And then we came to this really, really fabulous, but very French manor house. You know, it was more like a manor house than a, a grand chateau. It's it's just beautiful. And I, st I paused and I said, oh, I really like that house. I think um, that's the house that my character would want to live in. And um, he said, who's your character? And I said, I don't know. I don't know who my character is, but I think that's the sort of house that she'd want to live in. And there was a woman standing out the front. She was just dressed in jeans and an old T-shirt. And she was um, talking to some tradies who were doing some work around the fence. And um, we'd obviously paused for a little bit too long. And she came over and she said, can I help you? Is we're cl you know, we're closed. Can I help you? And I said, um, no, no, I said, uh, you know, we're just, we're just, we're just admiring this beautiful house. And she said, well, would you like to see inside? And we were quite taken aback by it. And I said, can we do that? And she said, well, I'm the owner. So uh, by all means, come on in. Where are you from? She found out we were from Australia. When I, when she found out that I was a writer and that I was trying to do this story, she thought it was fabulous and she said well and i said what's your story how come and she started to tell me that she was a sixth generation champenoise so down the generations it had been handed from son to son to son to son and finally there's this girl and it's her and her name's sophie and um so she is now the owner of the champagne house and she is the head champagne maker um, and I just got completely seduced by this wonderful woman who, you know, entered my mind like a meteorite. And I thought, well, of course, this is the story. It's, it's about you, Sophie. I'm going to write your story, but I'm going to take it back, you know, 100 years. It's going to be um, World War One, and it's going to be um, a, a champenoise, a, a woman who inherits and on she goes and so it was just by chance and i know my husband was just shaking his head saying i don't know how you do this i don't know how this has happened but you've got your story and it only took a few minutes from walking down um the avenue so i f i do feel blessed um and i can assure you all that story is now written it's in the vault with penguin random house and i suspect from um next week I'll be knee deep in the edit for it. Um, we've done quite a few drafts and now we've got a working draft that we're all very happy with, um, thrilled with actually. And um, now we're moving to the copy edit. So we're not far away from that release, which will come up uh, as usual. I'll be coming through at the end of October with, um, I don't have a name for it or I'd give it to you. We're all wrestling with names. In fact, we're arguing. That's the truth of it. I'm drawing a line in the sand. My editor's drawing a line in the sand. The marketing team's drawing a line. We're all saying, no, no, it has to be called this. So we're, we're still at that stage of um, batting back and forth various titles. So in-house, we just call it the champagne book. So I will release details as soon as I know its name, but that's what's coming up next. And for those of you who love the crime, um, oh, we've got a question. For those of you who love the crime, yes, I am writing the third Jack Hawksworth novel. I'm busy at it, I promise, and that will be coming out next year. Let me just take this question. It's, it's so lovely that somebody... Now, this person is asking me, this is Rowena. Uh, hello, Rowena. Um, do you ever get writer's block? Rowena and all the writers out there, absolutely not. It doesn't exist. Writer's block is something we've all made up to give us an excuse because for some reason we've decided to stop writing. Don't give yourself the excuse of writer's block. It doesn't exist. It's all in here, okay? So what you have to do is sit down and write. Even if you're not writing your manuscript, start writing something else. Start writing um, stories about your childhood. Start writing about your mum and dad. Start writing about the things that annoy you. Start writing about write a book for children, write, write a shopping list, just keep writing, keep writing, keep writing, and off it, and it will happen. Let me tell you about this champagne book, Rowena. I um, 
some of you know that I lost my father last year. Um, it was an enormous blow. I mean, I thought he was 93. I mean, dad had been, um, he'd had a fabulous life and I'd had a fabulous life with my father. So I have no reason to sit down and say, you know, oh, woe is me, you know, I'm losing dad. I'd had him for a long time. But dad was like Peter Pan. He was still partying, still dancing, still drinking, still um, loving life. So it was a shock. It was such a shock to all of us to lose him. And we lost him really quickly. Now, I thought I was stoic through that time last year. Um, I thought I held my family together very well. I thought I didn't let them down because I was strong. And um, Penguin probably thought we're not going to get a book this year. But I delivered a book. They couldn't believe it. They were absolutely astonished that something had come through. Um, of course, through all that stoicism and everything, the book where I really suffered was with the book. So the book was um, not up to par. You know, it was fabulous. I mean, my my editor said, "I can see there's a story here. There's a fabulous story, but it's not. It, there's some. It's not quite working." And so I went back and did another draft. And she said, "Oh gosh, I love that new that new start you've given us. Do 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 do, but it's still not quite right. Can we try?" It? I went back and I did another draft. I have delivered five drafts, and on the fifth draft, um, I could hear the cheering from Melbourne. They they were just like. We were all, I was crying, my editor was crying. She said, you've nailed it, you've nailed it. It's beautiful, it's brilliant. It's better than The Pearl Thief, it's better than The Diamond Under. But the thing is, Rowena, I could have just sort of fallen into a heap and thought, you know, it, I, I just don't know what to do. But I didn't, I just, I just went back to my keyboard and just started writing. I'd go into a scene and I'd think, how can I improve this? What can I do? And I just kept writing. Now, I know that feels a bit abstract, but that's the truth of it. Don't stop writing. Even if you have to stop on your manuscript, maybe write something else and don't stop writing because um, the, the wheels will grease again and you'll find your mojo, I promise. Writer's block doesn't exist. Um, have we got another question? What does that say? <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Um, it, it, somebody's saying, love you, Fiona, because uh, I, I might have helped someone who was maybe having a little bit of writer's block. What have we got now? Hello, Mark. Um, it, this, Mark is saying, hi, Fiona. If you could have dinner with one of your characters. Oh, it's easy, easy, easy. Saxon Vickery from the Tea Gardens. Um, is anyone cheering on the other end there? Oh my gosh, remember when he was doing the yoga upside down? Um, okay, we'll leave it at that because that's a beautiful scene. Saxon Vickery is this um, very remote man. He's like Mr. Darcy, really. He's, he's enigmatic, he's very um, elusive, he's hard to understand, he's prickly, and yet he's fabulous. He's funny, he's um, unpredictable. He's very handsome and very romantic, but in a sort of a um, standoffish way. And everything about him appeals to me, everything, everything, uh, especially that I modelled him on the Robert Redford of um, the sort of 1980s. Um, once I say that, you all know why I'd have dinner with Saxon Vickery. Coming in at number two, who I would also have for dinner, would be Colonel Killian from The Lavender Keeper. He is, um, well, he's... He's Daniel Craig as James Bond. If you imagine Daniel Craig, that's Colonel Killian, and that's who I want at my dinner table. And I'd serve him and Vickery naked quite happily. All of us naked, in fact. Now, I've got to be careful. I don't know who's listening. So my mum might be listening. Okay. I would have dinner with Will. Okay. <laughs> this is Emma. Hello, Emma. Um, she would have dinner with Will, and she doesn't mean my son Will. She means Will Thursk from um, a fabulous uh, trilogy that I wrote called The Quickening. So for anybody out there who's never tried fantasy, I think Emma would like you to give it a go because she thinks it's it's red hot. So do I personally, but anyway. Here's, here's Margaret. Hello, Margaret. Um, I would love to dine with Jack. And she Margaret doesn't mean my son Jack. I have a son called Will and a son called Jack. She means Jack Hawksworth. And who wouldn't? Yeah, Margaret, Jack Hawksworth is, is terrific. And um, I'm so enjoying being back with him. Um, I wrote him 10 years ago. 
And now, I, and I wrote two books with Jack Hawksworth, and now due to demand, um, I'm writing uh, a third book and absolutely loving being back in London with Jack and all of his trials and tribulations. So good on you, Margaret. Um, all right, waving to all of you. What else can I tell you? Okay, the book for, I can tell you about the book that's coming up for 2021. Um, and I won't get too far ahead of myself, but I do work um, a long way ahead. And I've already done all the physical research for it, I think. I often go back two and three times, and I know you're thinking, no, Fiona, we know that's just your way of going, getting on a plane and going somewhere. Um, it sounds like that, but most of the time I'm in the bowels of a um, you know, museum or a library, or I'm uh, digging around trying to find history. I'm not sitting on a sidewalk cafe and sort of, um, I don't smoke actually, but I don't know why I'm doing this, but drinking absinthe and sort of smoking and, and thinking, I'm, I'm not doing that. So um, this story, I've done most of the physical location work and I was in Germany last month to do just that. Um, and this story is going to be a spy story that's set in the 1930s. So pre-World War II, but just as Hitler's on the rise. And I'm very, very excited about this book because it's going to be a bit like The Lavender Keeper and a bit like The Pearl Thief all rolled into one. And I hope it's going to be super tense um, and super romantic as well. So hang on, I've got another question here, people. Uh, this is from Paige. Hello, Paige. Hi, Fiona. How do you know what to research? Qu a very good question. How do you know what to research when you head overseas for a book? Because I've explained that I really don't have the story. So what I do is I think about where do I want to set this story? And, and I usually do know that. I know my main city. So I know if it's Paris and Prague and London, for example, for the Pearl Thief. Um, or I know it's Provence and Paris and London for the Lavender Keeper. I, I know my places because for me, place does come first. And being this traveler, this um, I've been in the travel industry before I was a full-time novelist. And so travel for me is second nature. And I, I it comes first in my mind, where do I want to set this story? And really, I do that for the reader as well. I think, where does the reader want to travel to armchair travel with me next for a story. So we've done India, you know, Darjeeling and um, the Himalayas, and we've done um, Morocco in the last dance, and we've done Turkey with Nightingale. I'm prepared to go absolutely anywhere for you to get the story, but I'm always looking for places that have got epic landscapes and um, a sort of an exotic setting or romantic setting that we can, um, will give oxygen to the story. So I do know uh, the places I need to research, when I get there, I start to realize what I need to research. Um, I've usually got um, a motif in mind. So like the diamonds, once we knew it was about diamonds, I didn't have the story, but I knew I had to learn about diamonds. Ditto with the tea gardens, I knew I had to learn about tea. The chocolate tin, I had to learn about chocolate. Um, the, um, uh, the perfumer's secret. I really needed to know how perfume is made and how it was made back in 1915. So I, I've got my um, motive and I know what I've got to research, but the actual story, that has to come. That has to come and find me and it will lead me in all sorts of directions. And that's why I have to keep going back and back because um, by the time I've come back after the first trip, I know more about the story and I have to go back and find other bits and pieces for it. Um, what else have we got here? Have we got another one? Who is this? This is Julie. Hello, Julie. Um, will the current travel restrictions affect? Yes. Now, there's a good question. Will the current travel restrictions restrict my work? It will. It absolutely will. I've just said that I've done um, two trips um, for this spy story that we're, I'm talking about. So I've done um, Britain. I sort of know where in Britain it's going to be set. And I've done some work in Germany, and I think it's going to be set around Munich, Nuremberg, rather than Berlin proper. Um, it may move into Berlin, but it's too vague at the moment. I, I did more like a recce trip into Germany, and the coronavirus began to chase us, and we were trying to outrun it, and we just got away in time. Um, so I will have to go back. Now, if that's not gonna happen in the foreseeable future, well, it does put me at a bit of a loss for what I'll do. And it's actually rolling around my mind. 
that maybe, just maybe, I have to write a story that's set in Australia and that's set in my own backyard. Um, so we will have to watch this space and see what happens. But yes, thank you. Uh, it is rolling about in my head. Can I write my spy story if I can't get back um, into Germany or into France or into Britain again for a, for a long time? Um, yeah, it's a real concern. We have got Myra. Hello, Myra. Thank you. Hi, Fiona. Have you ever considered setting a book in Australia? Well, there you go. Yes, I have. But you know, the reason I've avoided it to date is because I think you can hear in my voice that I didn't, I wasn't born here, right? So I was born on the other side of the world in the Northern Hemisphere. I was born in England on the South Coast in a place called Brighton. And ever since I've lived here and become a writer over here, I mean, my my heart is here, it really is. My soul's in Britain, but my heart lives here. And I'm married to an Australian. My sons are Australian. Um, I've lived here for um, 40 years now. So, you know, I'm very much an Australian. I barrack for the Australian 11. You know, I've got my own footy team, blah, blah, blah. But the writers of Australia, they write Australia so very well. When you think of someone like Tim Winton or, um, you know, um, Flanagan, all of these people, um, they they write about Australia so well because it's in their soul. They grew up here. They were born here. They were raised here. I wasn't. I was raised on the other side of the world. So, you know, I, I can't help that my leanings understand the Northern Hemisphere so very well and that my memory is triggered for, um, you know, Europe, you could say. And so for me to write Australia, I'd feel a bit like... Um, uh, you know, an imposter, and I wonder, can I write it as well as the people born here write about the land they love so very much? But why not, Myra? Why not? Especially now where there are restrictions and maybe I will have to look to write an Australian story. I'd like to have a go, but I am nervous about it. Um, thank you for all those questions. I don't know if there are any more. Keep them coming if you want to. I'm not going to run away. I hope you've all made a cup of tea. I did. Mine's going a bit cold now, but I'm going to have a quick sip. Hang on. Mm. There is Adam. Hello, beautiful you. Um, this is Adam CC. He's a writer. He's a fabulous writer and just going great guns at the moment. Adam, you've written in a few genres now. Is there any genre you wouldn't tackle? I have written in a few genres. I cut my teeth on fantasy, um, and that is because I did a masterclass with Bryce Courtney, um, the maestro, and I wanted to write historical fiction. And he knew I was going to be a writer from the moment he met me, but he took me aside and he said, uh, darling, you're not going to write historical fiction just like that. You're not, because it demands um, so much of you as a writer and you haven't got the skills yet. And he said, what are you reading right at the moment? If I opened your bag and pulled out the book that's in there, what is it? And I said, oh, it's a, you know, it's a fantasy. And he said, do you read a lot of fantasy? And I, I do. I, I did at that stage. Um, this is back in um, the year 2000. I was devouring very high quality fantasy and I was reading it and loving it. And he said, write that because you understand that, Fiona. So write that. And when you've worked out how to put together a book and how the flow found your voice and found your storytelling rhythm and you understand, you know, the ebb and flow of a great story, then come and talk to me about writing historical fiction. And I, I listened to him and I did 10 years of fantasy. So I wrote, I think I wrote something like 14 big fantasy novels before I felt ready. And I wrote the crime novels as well in between. Why did I write crime? I wrote crime because I was writing fantasy so fast that my publisher said, stop, we cannot keep up with you. You're delivering too many manuscripts. And I said, well, I can't stop because I, I've started so late in life. I really want to just keep writing as fast as I can. And they said, well, just write something else for us. And I said, well, like what? And they said, oh, just write a crime or something. Do you read crime? And of course, I, wrote, I read lots of crime and I still read lots of crime. I love crime. And um, so they said, well, just write a couple, write some crime for us and we'll be glad to publish that. And so I wrote fancy, then I wrote crime, and then I thought, okay, 
I have found my voice. I do know who I am as a writer. I do know how to put together a good story. Um, and so I was ready to tackle the big one, which is historical fiction. And of course, I did bring a lot of that skill across. And that's why it, it took me so long to get to it. So I've written all of those. I've written for children. What wouldn't I write? I definitely wouldn't write uh, horror. And I definitely wouldn't write science fiction because I don't know enough about either and I don't read them to be able to um, confidently enter that genre. Uh, what is there anything else? Yeah, I won't write category romance. By that I mean it's, it's it, the story is the romance. So boy meets girl, they're pulled apart, but they get together in the end and it's a happy ending. Pardon me to all the fabulous romance writers out there. I didn't mean to make that sound in any way denigrating but you know it's formulaic and that's what romance readers want they want that they want that f sort of uh, structure to the story well I, I i don't want to write like that so i want to write historical adventuresome um tense dramatic emotional dramas that are romantic in every sense of the word romantic settings romantic era romantic characters um, you know, and and love in there, of course, as well. So um, yeah, there. I, I would. I know I write nonfiction. I enjoy nonfiction. Um, I'd love to write a cookery book, um, but I. Th that's a huge undertaking. Um, yeah, I don't think there are many other genres I wouldn't write um, other than horror or science fiction. I don't think, but there are probably some I don't know about, even some subgenres. Thank you, Adam. Who's this? This is, sorry, I've lost my glasses. Who's this? Philip, hello, Philip. What are you reading at the moment? Philip, I'm. thank you for that. I am reading a stack of books, all nonfiction, about the, um, uh, the loss of democracy. Um, I mean, are you all going to sleep already? Are you all just going like this saying, let's go, let's put Netflix on. We've had enough of her. I, yeah, it's the rise of Nazism, um, the Third Reich and the loss of democracy. And the great question that we all ask, don't we? I'm sure you do. I'm sure over breakfast tomorrow you will ask this question. How did it happen? How did a country that was as brilliant as Germany was in the 1920s. It was the most um, open-minded liberal country. How did Hitler manage to not only uh, find a platform, but take over the country as a dictator and lead it into the pathway that he did? How, how, how? I want that question answered because I need it for my story. And so I'm reading loads and loads and loads of nonfiction about the rise of Hitler, um, the loss of democracy, um, you know, what what Germany felt like socially through those years, through the 30s. Um, it's heavy, heavy stuff. Um, but at the same time, I, I do enjoy it. I would be lying if I said I don't enjoy it. Um, and I love the 30s, so I'm going to enjoy the fashion of the 30s. I'm going to enjoy um, the, the, the music and um, the atmosphere of the 30s when I come to write this book, if I can write it by getting back overseas. Thank you for that. That was a, that was a lovely question. Um, if there are any more, um, I don't want to keep you. I don't want to keep you from your families or from your um, streaming television. I'm hoping I've covered a lot of ground for you and that... This has been fun. Um, I've been talking a lot at you all. I wish I could hear you to chat to. Um, I am podcasting at the moment. If anybody wants to find it, I'm sure Dimmicks doesn't mind me mentioning. It's called Unscripted. So if you look for Fiona McIntosh, Unscripted. Um, I'm on iTunes. I'm on Spotify. You can catch up with my ramblings, unrehearsed, just my thoughts at the, in, in that moment. Um, and what else am I doing? Um, my newsletter will keep coming out to all those wonderful subscribers. I'll keep baking. Um, I'm staying. I'm lucky. I live, um, I do live in Adelaide. Um, thank you. Who's that? Lovely Jen, Jan, saying you are a fabulous baker. I'm just a home baker, Jan. Baking used to scare me, you know. I was very frightened of baking. Um, cakes always failed. Biscuits always turned to glue. I was rubbish. And what? I get insulted. I insult myself when I'm not good enough at something I take on. 
And so I decided I would stare down this beast and I would learn how to bake. And so I've had, um, in my time, I've had a lot of failures, but these days I have a lot more success than I have failures. Um, and the boys, my children, love taking pictures of when I have a fail. And it's always funny. And the thing is, what they like most is that I don't care. I laugh as much at the fails as um, I take joy out of the successes. But yeah, as you practice, there are a lot more success than there are fails. Um, and I, I can't remember the last fail. You, you just gain this confidence and in anything, whether you're riding a bike or learning to swim or learning to bake or garden or, or knit, um, and I fail a lot at knitting, but yeah, baking just comes with practice and I do enjoy it and it's a way of disconnecting. Baking is like Zen, you know, when you're stirring and you're weighing out ingredients and you're putting on the oven and you're lining tins and you're doing all this stuff, you're, you're completely disconnected from the writing. But I do believe that back of brain takes care of business. And I know that while I am doing all of that, stories are forming and, and maybe little hurdles and problems in my manuscript are being solved. I'm sure that's why I got to that fifth brilliant draft of um, the champagne book was because I did so much baking to take my mind off um, the any anxiety that I might have had. I didn't have any anxiety. I just thought, oh gosh, another draft and I'd go back into it. So hang on, we've got lovely, it's Rhonda. Um, hello, Rhonda. Mwah. You are wonderful to listen to, Fiona. How kind you are, thank you. I feel like I've been just rambling, but um, you're all wonderful. It's very weird sitting here and staring into a camera, knowing that there are people on the other end of it. But isn't this lovely that we can connect? Isn't this chapter one initiative brilliant? Um, so I think we should thank Dimux for putting this on for us. Um, I want to thank my son, Jason, who has just been sitting here. He's heard it all before, but he's been sitting here just in case I knock over the camera or do something really ridiculous um, with all this tech equipment around me. Um, so thank you to all of you for logging in and listening to my ramblings. Um, keep the questions coming. Through. You can join me on Facebook anytime you like. Just send through questions or send through requests for the newsletter. And know that um, I'm very grateful to you all. I personally feel I am the luckiest writer in the world. I have, without doubt, the best audience on the planet because it's all of you. And I'm not just saying that. I, re I say it to all the booksellers. I'm a lucky girl. I'm the luckiest writer. I've got this fantastic audience that just gives me so much affection um, and always comes to my events with chocolate. So for that alone, I'm going to blow you all a good night kiss. And I want you to stay safe. Keep your distance. Stay at home. Let's knock this thing. Um, but stay in touch with each other. Look how we can do this. I'm sure we can do it again. Please support Chapter One. There's going to be some fabulous writers coming on. Um, and thank you to Dimux once again for this wonderful evening. So I am blowing you all a very big kiss. And um, I think it's time we all went and got another cup of tea and watched some Netflix. So good night, everyone. Wherever you are, sleep tight. And I'll see you next time.